For yeah. those who have just uh, joined us uh, on Facebook, and I just want to welcome all of you. And uh, 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 introduce our two uh, wonderful team members who are uh, joining me in conversation uh, today. We may have one or two more coming on, but uh, Janice, Janice Poss, uh, and uh, Kathy Creighton. And what we were just talking about was uh, Kathy did a um, training seminar with Pax Christi last Saturday, and it was broadcast on Zoom. And we are wondering if it uh, might be, uh, the video of it might be available on the Pax Christi um, website. Uh, as of yesterday, I did not find it on there, but uh, hopefully it will be. It was, it was a very good presentation on, um, on racism and getting beyond victimization. And uh, uh, Kathy had some very good things to say, and uh, so did her um, long distance uh, uh, partner in speech um, and concern, uh, Tom Cordaro, I believe his name is. Mm -hmm. And so uh, hopefully that will be available uh, for a larger number of people to see. Anyway, we've got seven people on uh, Facebook Live now, and um, uh, uh, I think we'll uh, just begin, as we usually try to, with a prayer. And I'm going to uh, pray one of my favorite psalms. I did several weeks ago also this same one. Uh, this is a psalm that, that has really been very much a part of my own uh, discernment of my vocation in the past, uh, uh, well, back when I was still in the seminary. It's Psalm number 16. And uh, so let us simply pray this uh, Psalm in, in very simple words. Protect me, O God. I turn to you for help. I profess you are my God, my greatest good. I once put faith in false gods, the idols of the land. Now I make no offering to them, nor invoke their names. Those who chase after them add grief upon grief. Lord, you measure out my portion, the shape of my future. You mark off the best place for me to enjoy my inheritance. I bless God who teaches me, who schools my heart even at night. I am sure God is here right beside me. I cannot be shaken. So my heart rejoices. My body thrills with life. My whole being rests secure. You will not abandon me to darkness, to the underworld nor send your faithful one to death. You show me the road to life, boundless joy at your side forever. So in response, Lord, we just ask you to help us to empty ourselves, empty ourselves not to create a wasteland but empty ourselves to create a home for you to come and dwell in your love, to give us new life, to be the foundation of all that we say and do so that everything we do may begin with your inspiration, may continue under the guidance of your Holy Spirit and come to fulfillment in your eternal love. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 So welcome everybody on, uh, on Facebook and welcome to Janice and Kathy. And 
what I wanted to do today is to continue to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Essenes and um, share a little bit of what is now being talked about increasingly, I think, in, in theological circles and um, some of the discoveries that have been made. I, I'm not going to be in you know, 10 minutes now, I'm not going to be able to get into a great deal of depth but I do want to scratch the surface, and I hope as a result of today, I'll be able to uh, publish and uh, put together in the comments and also in the YouTube video, uh, uh, kind of a reading guide, kind of a bibliography of some of the current things, at least that I'm reading that have helped to form me. Um, up until fairly recently, anything that you would read about the Essenes uh, in scriptural circles, they said, well, they were a community of strange uh, monks, offshoots of, uh, out, off, out of the norm of the Judaism of the day of Jesus, down in a sort of a monastic-like uh, compound in uh, uh, Qumran, which was near the Dead Sea. And then they discovered in 1948, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and that seemed to be, scholars are more and more skeptical of this, but that seemed to be uh, the result of the, uh, uh, that Qumran community. But you know, they were kind of isolated down there. Uh, Archaeologists over the last 40 or 50 years uh, have been discovering more and more things about the Essenes as well as rereading some things that have been known, like the, uh, uh, the Jewish Wars, um, kind of a documented history by Josephus. Uh, as well as some writings of Philo, both of whom were vaguely uh, a little bit after the time of Jesus, within the, within the first century, though. And then uh, a couple of Roman writings, too, talking about the various uh, factions among the Jews. Uh, we know from the New Testament, because Jesus fought with these people, we know a lot about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And it, that's all that we really know. It's sort of like, well, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, okay, they're basically the Jewish people of Jesus' day. Um, those who read a little bit more deeply know that the Pharisees and Sadducees absolutely opposed each other and had diametrically opposed ideas about what it meant to be a faithful Jew. Uh, they both upheld the Torah, the first five books, the law, but for the Sadducees, that was all. If it's not, it, it was a very fundamentalist view of the Torah. In other words, uh, if it's not in the Torah, it's not, it, it, it's not authentic. The Pharisees accepted a broader canon of, of scriptures, the Torah supplemented by various other books, wisdom writings, the Psalms, the, um, uh, the prophets, and they saw all of those as being normative to their faith too. But they also decided that the Torah was so important to, uh, uh, to observe meticulously that they erected a fence around it. Uh, they were builders of walls rather than, than bridges. So what they did was uh, they added hundreds and hundreds of additional prescriptions so that, you know, keep holy the Sabbath day. They, they, um, they, they built all kinds of uh, uh, rules that prevented 
you know, basically what you could and couldn't do on, on the Sabbath and that sort of thing. Uh, Josephus identifies two other groups. By the way, the Sadducees also were the temple elite. They were priests, not just priests, but they were also the rulers of the temple who, who basically had a political philosophy of appeasement to Rome. In other words, if we get out of line, and if we let all these other people get out of line, like the Pharisees, like these Essenes, which we'll hear about in a minute, if we get out of line, uh, the Romans are going to come in and destroy us, which actually did happen some years later, in, uh, twice in 70 AD, and then again in the 120s, uh, the Bar Kokhba uh, revolt. So uh, they didn't want that to happen. They wanted to do everything they could to be on the political correct side of Rome. The Pharisees, uh, they were kind of hoping for, through the goodness of their life, that the Messiah might come and free them from Rome. Now, the Essenes were kind of a separatist group. And we know about them mostly but not exclusively from uh, uh, Josephus, the, uh, the one that I uh, mentioned earlier, the historian. And uh, he wrote about four distinct uh, uh, factions of the Jews. He called them sects, factions uh, that he even used the word, I think, philosophical, philosophical group, you know, that, that each one had a different understanding of what it meant to be uh, and to live faithfully as God's people. And he said that these Essenes, they weren't just located down there by the Dead Sea, but they had an, uh, an origin of a couple of hundred years earlier uh, being a separatist group who claimed to be direct descendants of King David and felt that they were the remnant from whom the, uh, the shoot, sort of like, you know, you have a, a cut off trunk of a tree and then a little shoot grows out of that to restore the tree. They felt that they were that group. All they had to do was to be truly, truly faithful in, in practice to, uh, uh, to God and not to compromise that in, in any way. Uh, they formed little colonies, sometimes in the larger cities, there's evidence that there was one in what is called the city of David in, uh, in, in Jerusalem, just outside the temple uh, area. Uh, they had some other cities that uh, are somewhat identifiable towns that were somewhat identifiable by their names. One was Nazareth. And the word Nazareth uh, comes from the Hebrew word for shoot, for a sprout. And uh, they saw themselves as the Netzarim, the, the offshoots of David, the ones who were holding on to this uh, as a branch, this trunk that had been cut off of David's line. They were still part of David's line and they treasured that very, very much. It's interesting that that whole shoot idea coming from the trunk is found in the Last Supper discourse of Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, Scholars are now beginning more and more to see allusions to uh, Essene thought in the teachings of Jesus. Not that, and I think this is important, 
Not that Jesus was necessarily a card-carrying Essene, uh, but rather that he probably launched from Nazareth as an Essene community and from his own family as Essenes, but he went beyond them. And he, there is some evidence that they had some difficulty with him too. Uh, things like that, that incident of his mother and brothers in, I think it's Mark's gospel, where they you know, want to come and take him away because he's gone crazy. Um, so there's a little evidence that, uh, hey, we're, um, uh, he was going beyond them. The, one of the areas where he went beyond them was they were expecting, of course, this Messiah to restore them as the center of Israel and what it meant to be God's people. And he moves on from them. He brings, he seems to bring a lot of their teaching, their way of life, their way of relating to God uh, with him in his, in his own teaching. And I think, you know, just a little footnote here. Uh, really, the, the teachings of Jesus are secondary to his redeeming work. In other words, the uh, immediately after Jesus' death and resurrection, what his disciples came to realize was that crucifixion and resurrection were central to what Jesus was and is and therefore what his followers are. The teachings are supplemental, how to live that way. But um, the, as St. Paul says, I preach Christ and him crucified. And you don't find Paul going a lot back to, oh, Jesus said this in this parable, and Jesus said that in that parable, and Jesus did this, and did, Jesus did that. You know, basically, he says, this is how you are to live if you are going to take Jesus Christ, be a faithful disciple, and, be, and that he is central to your, um, to your new way of life. So uh, we are becoming increasingly aware that the context within which Jesus lived and went to his death and within which he rose from the dead and brought, uh, you know, sent the disciples in the power of the spirit forward to, to, essence, to essentially bring what it means to be authentically Jewish, authentically God's people, to bring that into the whole world, to be inclusive of everybody in the world rather than exclusive. And here is one, where, one place where, um, where Jesus really did depart from the mainstream of, of uh, uh, Essene uh, practice and thought and prayer. And it's, it's really quite interesting that, that uh, uh, St. Paul picks up on this because one of the prayers that any Jewish male would say is, my God, I thank you, like that Pharisee, my God, I thank you that I'm not like the rest of people. Uh, my God, especially, my God, I thank you that I am not a woman. That my God, I thank you that I am not a Gentile. My God, I thank you that I'm not a slave. Uh, I don't think I don't think it was quite in that order, but I think it was Gentile first. But anyway, you know, Paul, I think twice says in Christ, there is no Jew or Greek. There is no male or female. There is no slave or free. So he was going right to the heart of uh, the 
traditional, if you will, Jewish identity at that time, and um, and saying the identity is right, but God's will is that it be broadened to be inclusive of all people. That I think would be the um, uh, the heart of what it meant to proclaim Christ. Now, uh, Nazareth. The evidence seems to be that Nazareth was probably a town of about two or three hundred people at most, uh, and was probably united in being a colony of like-minded Essenes. And you would uh, kind of, the analog today would probably be the um, Hasidic Jews, uh, those who uh, are kind of separatist, you know, like the ultra-Orthodox in Jerusalem uh, now, uh, kind of separatist, uh, adhering to a very strict way of life, but uh, sort of closed in on themselves. And the what, what's interesting is I think Jesus was formed in that kind of perhaps somewhat rigid spirituality, uh, somewhat rigid way of being Jewish. But then uh, alienated everybody by opening it up, saying there is no, uh, there is no limit to God's uh, love, to God's care for all of his people. Uh, so that's a little bit of it in a, in a nutshell. It's interesting also that uh, I mentioned there were four sects or groups of Jews identified by uh, Josephus. The fourth were the Zealots, uh, sometimes called the uh, Sicarii, I think in Latin. And Sicarii meant dag dagger car carriers because they were advocating, of course, a violent overthrow. They would be uh, the equivalent of terrorists. And it's quite interesting that one of the uh, disciples of Jesus, Simon, the member of the Zealot party, not Simon Peter, but the other Simon, was a member of that group. Uh, he must have had some tremendously uh, difficult times with the rest of the disciples <laughs> or they with him. But it's interesting, Jesus chose a, a, an immensely a uh, diverse uh, group of people. And, you know, just imagine Matthew, the tax collector, trying to relate to Simon, the zealot, who probably was still carrying a dagger under his cloak to do away with people like Matthew. Hmm. That, that does put an interesting spin on it. One of the, and, and I'll finish with this. Now, one of the interesting things about The Chosen, uh, that uh, series on uh, the life of Jesus and the apostles, um, in the last episode that was just, last two episodes released a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, begins to show some real tension between uh, Matthew and especially between Matthew and Peter. Uh, for reasons that were obvious earlier, because Matthew was one of those who um, really threatened Peter and his livelihood, Simon Peter and his livelihood and all of that. Anyway, watch The Chosen if you want to get uh, a little interesting insight there. Uh, I think that's about all that I'm going to say for today. There are a couple of other elements of, of Jesus' background that I may want to talk about in future. Uh, but what I, one thing that I would like to do is I hope within the next, well, before the day is out, I hope to be able to have online a little reading guide, at least what is my personal reading guide to um, learn a little bit more about 
the Essenes and other elements that fit into the context of Jesus that can help us to get a little better appreciation of Jesus' Jewishness and how he fit within the what it meant to be Jewish in his day and then what that can mean to us. So, uh, Kathy and Jan, any thoughts, reflections? Carry this on for a few minutes. <clears throat> I'd like to hear more. I'd like to hear more because I don't think I've totally grasped what you said about the, I understand what you said about the Pharisees adding on all these rules and regulations. But I, can you tell me again why they did it? Because since they were like the more quote unquote liberal or brought, had a broader view, were they just trying to protect their identity? I, I'm sorry that I missed that part of why they did that. Yeah, protect their identity. Um, yeah. Uh, as I understand it, and I'm, I'm not going to say my understanding is perfect, but, but they would have been, uh, I'm not too sure that the categories of liberal and conservative really fit here. Okay, yeah. Because they would have had their own, their, their, their own liberal and conservative elements, depending on which side of the spectrum you're looking at them. Oh, well, that's I'm, not too, I'm not too sure that I buy into at all this whole dualistic uh, division of, of uh, people and political positions and so on. Anyway, uh, one thing that the Pharisees were, were obsessed with is they wanted to be sure that they were pleasing God by keeping his commandments that's to the right. fullest. And so it was sort of like uh, walking along the side of a cliff. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, a couple of miles down this way here, mm -hmm. where I am is Palos Verdes Peninsula. There are areas you can park on the side of the road and go to the very edge of the cliff. and. Some people use that as an opportunity for, um, for suicide, but that doesn't happen too often, fortunately. But the fact is, uh, you can get dangerously close to the edge of that cliff, and the ground is not really too stable there. So it's much, uh, the Pharisees would be ones who would say, let's measure off 50 feet from the edge of that cliff and build a fence there, okay. just to be sure that you don't get in danger of falling off of it. So, um, uh, the basics of kosher food, for example, are found in the Torah. The foods that are clean and unclean, mm -hmm. for example. And then there's that one little, um, uh, little, uh, uh, what would you say, um, command, uh, do not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Mm. Well, the way that you uh, avoid any possibility of violating that commandment is to completely separate dairy from meat. And if you essentially even have separate kitchens or at least separate utensils for dairy and for meat, you know, there's no way that you will risk violating that commandment. It's that sort of mentality that uh, seemed to characterize the Pharisees. Okay. The Sadducees, for whatever reason, were more interested in the proper performance of temple sacrifice. The Pharisees were saying, yeah, the temple's important, but we can't all live right. there. And, um, and mm -hmm. so Pharisaic Judaism is what eventually developed into rabbinic Judaism after the time of the temple. Because mm -hmm. once the temple was destroyed, 
there was no reason for the Sadducees to even possibly continue to exist. Mm. Mm. The Essenes were devoted to the temple, but they felt that the Sadducees and the officials had corrupted it so much that they boycotted it. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, hmm. that's at least in in broad in broad terms. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I so um so you know I I misspoke I I didn't want to you know try to compare it with liberal. But you did, but I do remember you saying that, and I that's why I was kind of so all this is kind of interesting to me. What you did say about the Pharisees, I thought I heard you say, was that they had a had a more had a more inclusive or had a broader understanding. I mean, or, or maybe you were just saying compared to the Sadducees, they weren't just tied to the to the temple. I mean, yeah, uh, could you speak a little bit more about that piece? Well, the, the Sadducees basically said. Uh, and and you, I don't know if you would call this conservative or not, but they've said if it's not in the Torah, it's not scripture. Okay. So, for example, um, resurrection from the dead right. is not in the Torah, right. but it is in later um, uh, writings dating from like the third, second, third century before Christ, mm -hmm. um, that allude to resurrection from the dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a big point between the Pharisees and Sadducees was that, you know, they would fight over that. And, and they tried to involve Jesus in that, mm -hmm. you know, the Sadducees came to him. It was the Sadducees, not the Pharisees, mm -hmm. who came to him and said, well, all this resurrection from the dead stuff. Well, what about the law, the Leveret law, that requires uh, a, a brother of a man who dies childless to have a child with his wife? Uh, now, supposing there were ten, you know, ten brothers, all of whom died childless, and. Mm -hmm. Each one of them married her. Well, in the resurrect, if, if there's this resurrection stuff, uh, whose wife is she going to be? Right. right. You know, so that's where they were trying to, mm -hmm. try, mm -hmm. trying to uh, right, trap him up. And so obviously there he was taking you know, firmly the, um, the, the Pharisee view that, you know, that, that, that's, that's irrelevant. Uh, in the resurrection, you're living like uh, angels focused on God rather than concerned about uh, about human relationships. Because he never, I don't, I don't. I'm trying to recall because his 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 scorn or his his criticism or his objections. He usually named the Pharisees. So when uh -huh. he was by name. Yeah, but, scribes and Pharisees. But the scribes he thought were the Sadducees. I mean, did, were those? No, the no. The, scri the, the scribes were. The, they they were the the scribes, the legal experts among the Pharisees. Right, the but recorders. he doesn't talk specifically to the Sadducees. I mean, do I have ever? Mm. Well, yeah, he does. He uh, does. The, okay. Mainly when he gets to Jerusalem, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the Sadducees were mainly in Jerusalem because that's where the temple, the was. temple was. Right, okay. But not all the priests were uh, Sadducees. They were, they were the controlling faction. But there were priests also who were Essenes, mm -hmm. probably. Uh, remember John the Baptist's parents, uh, Zachary and Elizabeth. Zachariah was a priest who right. had temple duty mm -hmm. and then went back right. home. Right. Uh, so uh, there were those divergencies uh, among them too. And one would imagine one would imagine that there were some very, very fierce debates. You know, one of the things Jews will even say about themselves is, um, where there are two Jews, you'll have three opinions. Um, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, many scholars will say, you know, these conflicts with the Pharisees, 
even if they would, and, and Sadducees, even if they would get kind of vile at times, name calling and, and you know, that sort of thing. That was a common way of discourse mm -hmm. uh, among the various philosophical schools. That was, that was nothing, uh, Jesus' way of, um, of, of um, arguing with them was nothing different from the way everybody argued with one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So uh, at least that, that, you know, that's a major part of the evidence that we've got of how people, how people disputed in those days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and evidently insults uh, flew furiously. And, you know, then they probably, after they finished, they'd go and get a cup of coffee. But evidently, Jesus uh, was enough of a threat to both sides mm. Mm. that it sort of united them in their opposition. And, and yeah, the, the memory, it, the memory of the apostles, the disciples, when they wrote it down was that they did try to get rid of him. They saw him as a threat, mm -hmm. probably as a threat in uh, not just difference of opinion, but that um, a threat to the uh, very identity of the, of, of the chosen people. Uh, Susan Brunasso has entered the room just about the time that we are actually uh, should be finishing up. Hello, Susan. Good morning. Good morning, morning to you. Uh, I see you're on your side. Yeah. So, oh, oh, I need to turn. Okay. Yeah. Just so, a moment. Now, that, at any rate, uh, I did promise that the Facebook live time would be a uh, uh, half hour. And of course, it's we're going on to uh, uh, forty minutes now. And uh, uh, we could go on a little bit more. We've got ten people actually on on Facebook. Uh, Janice, do you have anything that you would like to unmute yourself? There. Well, you know, I mean, what you were saying about Paul, which of course most of us who've done any any studying of Paul know his his emphasis on the cross and the resurrection, um, as you said, as opposed to maybe Christ's teachings. But I would see that, you know, basically, I think because he sort of came after Christ. So for him, it seemed more important to emphasize those two things than to emphasize the teachings. So, mm -hmm. and obviously that's what we're living with because he was the one that really was so zealous about going out and, and preaching as, as widely as he did in, mm -hmm. in the area, mm -hmm. which is what we have as part of the tradition. So, you know, it's, it's kind of his construct, which, you know, I think sometimes overshadows the teachings in my estimations, because for me, I think it's stronger the teachings than than looking at at the cross and the resurrection, and also looking at you know the the infancy infancy narratives of the birth. Mm -hmm. So, which we don't emphasize, I think sometimes enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to use use a. A little, a little tactic of a professor that that uh, that I had back when I was in Rome, Burkhard Neunhäuser. He would always say, uh, "You are right. You are right." <laughs> but, <laughs> in other words, uh, yes. But there is is one further consideration, which I think one of the things that helps to shed light on Paul and the Gospels is that Paul, everything Paul wrote and actually his life ended uh, 
probably 20 years before the Gospels were actually written. Mm. So I, I think there's, there's a couple of things that, that are relevant there. One of which is much of the teachings of, uh, of Jesus in his sayings and his parables uh, were alive. He didn't have to include them in the in the uh, in his writings because they were already alive in in, in the community. Right. What uh, uh, the other thing is, uh, he was not an eyewitness to those things, so he probably wouldn't be telling those stories, uh, at least not as an eyewitness. But he would have certainly been telling them uh, as part of the ongoing catechesis. We make a big mistake, I think, by seeing the letters of Paul in terms of catechesis. You know, uh, they are not summaries of Christian doctrine. They are problem solving. There are these problems coming up in his communities and he's trying to address those problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I think it really is important to, to see both the Gospels and uh, letters of Paul in, in uh, maybe some tension, but certainly some reinforcement. Uh, the Gospels as written down did not exist yet when Paul was writing those letters right, or when he true. was preaching. Nor can we say that the letters are summaries of his catechesis. No, they're written in order to convince people of um, what the demands of following the, the way of Christ are and how to address conflicts and problems within, within their, uh, their life. Uh, I, I do think that the death of Jesus is central to the gospels as well, rather than teaching simply by the amount of time that each evangelist goes into uh, describing them, yeah. you know, uh, up to a third of the of the uh, gospel texts uh, concentrate on the passion and death of mm. of Jesus, um, or what immediately led up to it. So, and it's interesting too how diverse various gospels are, especially John from the Synoptics, and yet how the events of the passion, those three days are told in very, very similar terms and very similar time frames. So Susan has raised her hand. Um, I've loved hearing all of this. I know I came on late, but I was listening to you. And um, there's, there's a two part thought here, or question I should say, when, when was it or has it always been where a sacrifice of an animal is is in thanks to God uh, in sacrificing whether it be a lamb or a goat um, when did that come about and how do we apply these the history and the teachings and the knowledge that that you have shared with today's world as far as inclusion and um, separateness and so forth so those are my my two I know that might go into a whole nother hour but so be it. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't know, my understanding is uh, sacrifice basically was something that was adopted from a general religious sentiment of, uh, of ancient peoples. Okay. You know, uh, with, with a couple of couple of twists on it. You know, generally, ancient peoples would sacrifice in order to appease a god. Yeah. Um, and without going into too much detail on that. And there was also a sense of sacrifice as an act of thanksgiving. And I think that, you know, one of the, if, if you look at the, at, at the 
progress of the Old Testament, uh, you kind of go from that sacrifice as appeasement, atonement, into sacrifice as thanksgiving. Because God, you have given me um, uh, the fruits of the earth, I will offer back to you the first fruits. That sort of thing. At the time of Jesus, sacrifice as such became very regularized as at the temple. And it became, of course, a source of profit. And so it became kind of a money-making industry, as it were, which is what Jesus, and following upon the Essenes, because this was their attitude also, uh, uh, Jesus reacted to that rather violently. Um, you know, uh, my father's house is a house of prayer and you have made it a den of thieves, that kind of thing. So what do you think about bringing all of this, the way that I've been rambling on, and, and it's kind of an insight into uh, this broader context of, of, uh, of Jesus and Jesus' Jewishness. What do you think about how that's relevant to us today? That's a big question. It is. It it's is. A big, it's a big question. And it and it and you know what, I would now I have to go in a little bit, but I would like to really think about that. I mean, obviously it does have relevance, but I would like to I would like some time to reflect on that because I think that's a really really, I mean, a, you know, it's a big question. Um, as I said. Well, perhaps you know, perhaps a question that we might, you know, th this might be good. Let's finish with it with with that question. Um, and I, I see two parts to it. Uh, one is what might be, what might be the impact of greater realization of Jesus' Jewishness? What might that speak to us today? And the second is um, the inclusiveness with which Jesus, as a Jew, right. challenged the Jewishness of his day. Both of those might be an interesting, interesting um, question to be thinking about. Uh, I'm going to try very hard to, before the day is out, I know I've promised this sort of thing before and haven't delivered, but I will try to uh, get some kind of a reading list to help to explore these areas of, of background for us. Does that make sense? Yes. And yes. you know, I mean, could you send it via email rather than rather than rather than Zoom? Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll I'll, I'll try to get it done uh, out in a number of ways, whether it's on, you know, I'll or yeah. Include and it on Facebook, I'll include it in YouTube. I will get it to you all in an email and I'll put it, I'll actually put it up on my website too. Okay. But, which I haven't done very much on lately, okay. but okay. maybe this will stimulate me to get into a little bit more activity of that sort. Okay. Okay. Well, God Let's bless you all. Shall we? Let's simply conclude with the Lord's prayer and then a final blessing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. So now I'm going to uh, say goodbye to the people on Facebook uh, thanks to all 12 of you who stuck with us. Um, and uh, there will be more, I'm, I'm sure, as the day goes on. I'll put this up. It'll repeat on Facebook, and, and I'll put it up on YouTube. So God bless you all, and bye-bye uh, to our Facebook friends. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.